On the 1st of November 1999, the fifth episode of Walking With Dinosaurs, Spirits of the Ice Forest was released. This episode takes place 106 million years ago in the mid-Cretaceous of Antarctica. When looking at all the episodes, Spirits of the Ice Forest was always the odd one to me. As a kid, I distinctly remember it being my least favourite, and the boring one. However, as I've aged, I've developed such an immense appreciation for this episode, not only for bringing attention to lesser known obscure animals, but also for showing dinosaurs in such a unique and interesting setting and environment. If I could sum up this episode in one word, it would be interesting. In my opinion, this is by far the most interesting episode, and also the one I learned the most from. Sadly, it also features the temporal and geographical errors Giant of the Skies in particular was plagued by. Many creatures did not live in the time and place of this episode's setting. In fact, none of them did. All the creatures that are featured in this episode were actually discovered in Australia, not Antarctica. However, the episode does explain that the two land masses were connected at the time, so I don't think it's implausible to assume some ventured into Antarctica but we'll get into that later. The opening scene of Spirits of the Ice Forest has a very somber tone, which sums up the episode very well. We get a glimpse of life in the Cretaceous South Pole, which despite being warmer than today, is still a very difficult place to live. This is made evident by the narration explaining that the beautiful sunrise our eyes are being treated to is the first the South Pole has seen in months after total darkness, and it will only last a few minutes. Yet in this brief time, we see the frozen corpse of a dinosaur, Lealonosaurus, being eaten by a bizarre aquatic predator before the sun disappears once again, as the title appears. Such a melancholic yet beautiful way to start an episode. Even the title, Spirits of the Ice Forest, is such an interesting title. It feels almost otherworldly and chilling, pun not intended which is essentially what this episode is when compared to the others. This is a different world of the dinosaurs that we almost never see in media, and I'm so happy it has been so wonderfully presented. I also think that overall, this episode has the best soundtrack. Judging each piece on its own merit and how effective they are at conveying the mood of a scene, I think this one takes the cake for me. This is made apparent by the utterly bombastic part of the track following the title scene, massively contrasting the cold and delicate start it had. Incredible stuff. The aerial view of the foggy forest and the haunting dinosaur calls in the background are just magnificent. The narration explains that because the climate is warmer than today, the South Pole has no ice caps, but rather highly seasonal polar forests. These forests and their inhabitants are subject to the pole night and midnight sun natural phenomenons. We are then introduced to the dinosaur Lealonosaurus, the main focus of the episode. The narration explains how these small, quick animals are adapted to living in the poles all year round, and I'm very pleased that they give the spotlight to what media typically identifies as the boring dinosaurs, small herbivores. I fell prey to this mindset as a child too, and labelled them as boring, as they didn't appeal to the awesome bro mindset that is ever present in dinosaur media. However, I now find them so incredibly interesting, especially considering these seemingly unassuming animals actually tough out the polar night during the winter. Sadly though, they would have been extinct by the time of the episode's setting, and in terms of accuracy, the model is fairly good but it should probably have a thick coat of feathers for insulation during the winter, and we now believe small ornithopods, like Lealonosaura, would have eyebrow ridges that make them look angry. The narration also states that they have large eyes that help them to find food in the dark. This is still debated, as this is based on the large skull openings in a Lealonosaura fossil. However, the specimen wasn't fully grown, and so may not be representative of an adult's proportions, or whether they had good night vision. We are then introduced to one of my personal favourite creatures in the entire series, Coolasuchus. This was the predator from the opening scene, a giant carnivorous amphibian who has been hibernating in the forest through the winter and now migrates to the river for the summer. 
The narration explains that creatures like these were once widespread millions of years ago, but as the climate has warmed, they have been outcompeted by crocodiles everywhere else in the world, but Kulasukas cling on at the South Pole where it is too cold for crocodiles. The model is essentially perfect too, both in CGI and animatronic form. However, it also would have been extinct by this time, most likely due to an increase in temperature and crocodiles invading its territory. Sadly, driving the last giant amphibians to extinction. Once again, the music is so dichotomous as it shifts from scratchy and eerie to joyful and calm as if transitioning from the cold, harsh winter to a warm and blossoming spring. I like how the narration gives insight into the plant life of the polar forests and how they are each specially adapted to the cool climate. It fleshes out the environment and makes it feel more real and believable. In the next scene, we see a Lialinosaurus clan building nests, and I really like the speculative behaviour of building decoy nests to protect the dominant pair's eggs. It feels very plausible and makes the animals feel more realistic and believable. We are then introduced to one of the most confusing creatures in the series, the quote-unquote Polar Allosaur. I'm not sure where to start with this one, as I've seen conflicting theories as to what this creature is supposed to be. The tie-in book states this creature is based on a fragmentary bone found in Victoria, Australia that may have belonged to a type of allosaur, but its affinities are questionable to say the least. However, the producers later went on to say that it is meant to represent Australovenator, a very different theropod from Queensland, Australia, that is a member of the Megaraptora, which in and of itself is a phylogenetic question mark. The narration also states that it is a summer visitor from warmer lands to the north, which in this case would mean Australia. This also supports the idea that it is a strollivinator, and so I suppose I'll judge it as a representation of that taxa. The model is obviously just a recolored Allosaurus, in which case it is inaccurate in many ways. The head is the wrong shape, as it should be longer and slenderer, the arms and legs should be longer, and the body should be less bulky. Despite it suffering from an identity crisis, I really like the green coloration with yellow stripes. Sadly though, the inaccuracies don't end there. Australovalita had yet to evolve during the episode's setting, and it also unlikely that it would have migrated such huge distances to the South Pole, as most large carnivores do not follow their prey on their annual migrations, with only a few exceptions. Back to the episode, the quote-unquote Australovenator has a failed attempt at hunting the Lialinosaurus clan in the most cliché way by snapping a twig by standing on it. I like the speculative behaviour of small animals like Lialinosaurus forming small clans and designating sentries, as many small animals today adopt this survival strategy. I adore the lighting on the Australovenator in the forest, very impressive for 1999. And the trend from Giant of the Skies continues as I have no idea what these migrating pterosaurs are meant to be. My best guess would be Mythunga, as they lived in Australia at the time, but who knows. We are then introduced to probably the noisiest creature in the series, the amazingly named Mutaburosaurus. They have also migrated from Australia, and in huge herds. Their trumpeting calls are iconic and maybe a little bit annoying if you listen for them for too long, but I find them quite charming personally. The model itself is really good, however they appear to possess a thumb claw like Iguanodon, which the real animal didn't have. Also the fleshy trumpeting nose may not be accurate, as in the real animal, the nose is made of solid bone and so couldn't act as a resonating chamber, but could potentially have anchored inflatable flaps of skin, so it's debatable if this is inaccurate. It's also now believed that Mutaburosaurus were fully bipedal rather than facultative quadrupeds as depicted, but to the show's credit, they usually showcase it walking on two legs more often than on all fours. The following scene shows a mother Lealinosaura tending to her nest as we see a mammal that I believe is meant to represent Steropodon, live acted by Akoti Mundi, despite Steropodon being more like a platypus. It is portrayed as an egg thief, and is seen off by the dinosaur in a humorous fashion via her bombarding the mammal with leaves. I like that this is our first glimpse at mammals in the series, as it is symbolic of how they are slowly but surely becoming more prevalent. I'll touch on this more in the next episode. 
I also like the showcasing of dinosaurs partaking in more mundane tasks such as minding their nest as it makes them feel more alive. The next scene, we see an Australovenator stalking a herd of Mutaborosaurus. This is not a hunt however, as the predator is merely trying to weed out weaker animals as he is faced with an aggressive defence by healthy adults, much larger than itself. I like this as it shows that the predator knows when it is outmatched and doesn't partake in violence just for the sake of entertainment, like in lesser dino docs. In the next scene we meet some hatchling Lealinosaurus. They are very cute and the mother watches over them and eats unhatched eggs, which makes sense as animals will take whatever nutrients they can get, especially in extreme environments like the South Pole. The narration also explains that during summer, the sun is out 24-7 and the flourishing plants are eaten by wetter, giant crickets to lie today in New Zealand, which in turn are eaten by Tuatara reptiles, also from New Zealand, both live-acted, and their inclusion helps make this unfamiliar South Polar world seem less alien to the audience. The next scene, we see a Mutaborosaurus herd plagued by parasitic insects, and showcases dinosaur anatomy, and where they are vulnerable to such creatures, such as in their softer ears and nostrils. It's an interesting part of dinosaur biology you don't often see, and I really appreciate it. It's also interesting to see how such tiny animals could drive away the huge herbivores. The next scene show Lealinosaurus sleeping in the forest by relying on their camouflage. It is very interesting to see the physical puppets disguised into the forest floor, and I'm pretty impressed how well their camouflage actually worked on me. We also get to see baby Lealinosaurus playing and practicing their lightning fast reactions for survival, which is very cute and fun to watch. The following scene shows a dead Mutaborosaurus being scavenged by an Astrolovenator. I like that we see both the active predatory side and the opportunistic scavenger side of this animal, as it makes it feel more realistic and fleshed out. To make it more confusing, the narration states that they are descendants of Allosaurus, which doesn't seem to be supported by any evidence I know of. It also states that their kind are rare in the Cretaceous, which I honestly don't know what exactly it is referring to. Allosauroids, Megaraptorans, non salurosaur theropods as a whole, I have no idea. The next scene establishes that the midnight sun is in full effect, and a young Lealinosaur is ambushed by a Coolosuchus at the river. The attack fails as the dinosaur's swift movement saved him, as established earlier in the scene where they were playing and practicing their survival skills. I believe this to also be symbolic of the oncoming extinction of not just Coolosuchus, but of giant amphibians as a whole, as throughout the episode's runtime we've seen them go from successfully scavenging a corpse in the intro, to ungainly waddling through the forest and being spotted by the sentry, to failing at hunting. Also, that shot of the Coolosuchus from below in the water is so cool. The narration then explains that Antarctica is subject to heavy flooding, and this drives animals together. From this, two rival Lealinosaurus clans clash over territory, and I like this speculative behaviour as food would be highly sought after in this environment and seems highly plausible. The following scene also showcases plausible behaviour as the floods subside and the Mutaborosaurus and Lealinosaurus browse the now rich vegetation together. As winter slowly approaches, our ears are graced by quite possibly my favourite piece of music on the entire soundtrack whose title also describes the scene so literally. Departure of the Mutaborosaurus. It is a reprise of the title theme for the episode, but it is such a beautiful rendition that is both sad and powerful as the huge herds of Mutaborosaurus depart as they migrate back north for the winter upon the first sunset in months. I like that they show some getting lost in the forest and that an inconvenience for them could be deadly for others, as made evident by their loud trumpeting deafening the Lealinosaura clan to a hunting astrolovenator that manages to kill the lead female. This in turn drives the clan into disarray as winter approaches. The Coolosuchus also returns to hibernate in the forest. The last time we see it, and the other two major creatures for this episode, those being the Mutaborosaurus and Astrolovenator. I noticed this upon re-watching these episodes, that all the other episodes have five to six creatures in them that play significant roles in the story, whereas Spirits of the Ice Forest only has four. Whilst this could just be due to Mesozoic paleontology in Australia and Antarctica being scarce, this grants more focus on the creatures that are present. As a result, 
I would argue that the Lealinosaurus are the most fleshed out creature in the series, as they are the only major creature to appear for the rest of the episode's runtime, and have already had a large amount of screen time so far. The only other creatures that come close to this level of development would be the Diplodocus from Time of the Titans, and maybe the Ornithocyrus and Tyrannosaurus from Giant of the Skies and Death of a Dynasty respectively. I believe this is also why I found this episode to be the most interesting and informative, and I think it gives this episode a unique identity amongst the others. I like how the narration explains how different plants respond differently to the cold, and again helps make the world feel more alive. The following scene, the polar night begins, and we are treated to the stunning southern lights, as the inhabitants of the forest have to adapt to the freezing temperatures, each with their own method. The wetter allows itself to become frozen, whereas the Lealinosaurus continue to forage for food. Also, Lealinosaurus, I view, is the best name for low light filming, period. I like that we see just how different the South Pole is compared to the summer, where food was plentiful. Now, water is frozen and food is scarce. The narration explains that the Lealinosaurus cope with the cold by ongoing a state of torpor by huddling together. It's a very interesting example of speculative behaviour, and I think it's definitely plausible. In the next scene, we see the wetter become unfrozen and the first sunrise in months. We then see the Lealinosaura clan competing for a new dominant pair, bringing the story full circle as they prepare to nurse their offspring in the year to come. The narration then explains that a drop in the world's climate will result in the freezing of the polar forest and drive them and their inhabitants to extinction. However, current studies suggest a warming trend for the rest of the Cretaceous, and dinosaurs have been found in Antarctica from later on in the Cretaceous, suggesting this statement to be incorrect, so perhaps the ending to the episode isn't quite as gloomy as the writers intended it to be. Despite my younger self finding this episode to be somewhat of a black sheep of the series, I have such positive thoughts on Spirits of the Ice Forest, and have such a grand newfound appreciation for this episode. The setting and subject matter is intriguing from beginning to end, and the focus on obscure species and environments is such a treat after constantly getting the same popular dinosaurs again and again. Whilst there are plenty of questionable inclusions, this episode has become one of my personal favourites, and it really did make me think about dinosaurs and their lifestyles in a different way, and I really like and appreciate that. As I'm writing the script for this review, I've noticed it's by far the longest so far, because there's just so much I wanted to say about it, which I think speaks volumes about the level of engagement I had with it. Overall, I really adore Spirits of the Ice Forest, and I would call it the most underrated episode of the bunch. Thank you for watching, click the card to see a review of a figure based on an animal that appeared in this episode, and hopefully we'll be reviewing the final episode, Death of a Dynasty, soon. Thank you, Bye bye now.